it's a wonderful time that we had just worshiping the Lord and continue also studying His Word. Uh, what a beautiful time and opportunity to gather in the name of the Lord every week, focusing on His Word, what He wants us to know and to do, and that is revealed to us through the Scriptures. We are really uh, grateful to God for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. May you get a wife soon. We just uh, finished the uh, first and second Samuel. We're going to get into the first Kings as we continue, but tonight we'll just take a break. Uh, we'll continue from next week, God willing, but tonight we'll be in Psalm 24. If you have your Bible, turn with me to uh, Psalm 24. And before we read, let us pray. God, we thank you again for this opportunity the God of the heavens and the earth, a loving God who has uh, given us an opportunity to stand before him even this night, Lord. I pray that as we read this psalm that was written by your servant David, that will be nourished by it, will be reminded of the great truth about our God, our Father, our Maker, and our Savior. I pray that our hearts will be lifted uh, to you as we pay attention to your word in Jesus' name, amen. This beautiful song that we have before us, Psalm 24, I love it. I've read it for, for years, you know, the, the many songs that we sing, whether, you know, on a Thursday or a Sunday, you know, occasionally we have favorite songs, right? <laughs> I love this song, but this is one of my favorite songs in, in, the, the, in the book of Psalm, written by David. If you have your Bible, let us read together. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in, those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, you gates, and be lifted up. You everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift up your everlasting door, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of Glory, Selah. Take a breath and think about what we just read. You know, we, we've been studying the life of, of David uh, in the greater portion of what we've been going through 
um, from his um, youth until when God anointed him king over Israel, all the battles that he's gone through, all the victories that God has given to him, and the fact that he knows that the God that he trusts in is the living God, and he comes and writes a very beautiful song, a wonderful song, um, probably reflecting on the time when the Ark of the Covenant was brought to its very place. That is what we, as we, we, we read through and we uh, look upon what he's trying to say, he didn't give us those details, but we can, you know, go back and forth and try to find really where this came from. And supposedly, it was written uh, in the occasion when David was bringing up the Ark of the Covenant and bringing it to his place. You remember the first time they tried doing that, and um, those who were ferrying the Ark of the Covenant saw that it was about to slide and fall off, and one guy tried to help by touching the Ark of the Covenant, which they were not supposed to do, and that guy died immediately, and David wondered, you know, you know who may do this? If we can't do it, if we can't bring it, or, you know, how are we supposed to do it when it, you know, gets down and break, what are we going to do? This is a very special um, thing that was instructed by God that they should make it as a remembrance of God and God's presence. And so, supposedly, when this came to its place, it was a joy to the man of God, David, um, that the ark was brought to the place where it was prepared for, and that uh, the intention was to lead the people above the vain external ceremonies that they've always had to a holy life of faith, and especially in Christ, on whom the ark is a type of. You give praises to the one who is worthy, not the gods that... Um, would give allegiance to. And so he begins here by uh, making a very wonderful declaration. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. So this psalm Technically, we could divide it in three portions. Uh, the first portion would be an ascription of praise to God, the maker and the one who upholds all things. An ascription of praise to God as the maker and the one who upholds all things. That is seen in Verses 1 and 2, the Lord is the maker of the heavens and the earth. And if you think about the heavens, you think about the earth as little as it is and as vast as the heaven is, that this God that um, David is describing here is the author of it. No other person made it. It is the God that he is bringing praise to the Lord. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. So these are the people who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, those who are called by his name, as well as those who dwell in it. Those people who have not um, worship God for who he is, 
they have given themselves to the worship of idols, they did not make themselves. The Lord is the maker of everyone, the earth and everything and everyone who dwells in, in it. We, we can follow up this even with the, uh, the preaching that Paul was giving to us on Sunday. You know, the tracing back to the beginning. And as I said on Sunday, if, you know, we would trace everything from the beginning, we would have less and less problems. But most of the time, we do not want to go back to the beginning because if we know who is the source, who is the maker, then that solves the bigger part of these problems that we have here on earth. So that is uh, the first part of this song. And then the second part uh, goes through verses 3 and 6. And it is an inquiry. Saying, who would ascend into the hill of the Lord and stand in the holy place? Who could be regarded as worthy to engage in his worship and to be considered a friend of God? Who is this person who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? Who is this person? Who, who, would you have a description of this person? As a believer, we, without reading the, the rest of the, the, the psalm, the rest of the song, who would you give this description? Who is this person? Who is this man? Who can stand before the Lord? Who is this man? Who can stand in the holy place, in the heel of the Lord? In Mount Zion, the holy place that God ordained that his name will be called upon. Or his holy temple. Paul reminds us, in, as he writes to the Corinthians, say, do you not know that you are God's? You're not of your own. You are God's temple. Therefore, only worship God. Do not worship other idols. If you know where you've, you know, the, the Savior who died for you, Jesus Christ, who may ascend to this place, to the hill of the Lord? Who is worthy to go to this place? You know, at times when you, you reach out to people, you're trying to uh, encourage them or preach the word of God to them, some people would say, well, I, I want to make things right before I come to God. When do you think that would be? If you'd want to make things right before you come before God. That means none of us is able to come before the Lord. None of us is qualified. If you're going to make ourselves holy before we stand before a holy God, uh, Isaiah says that our, our righteousness is as filthy rags. Who may? And I have titled this psalm, my own little title here, the Clean Hands, Pure Hands, and Intentional Seekers. He goes ahead and to say, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, Oh, he gives us uh, a criteria, an idea of those who can stand before this holy God. First, he, may, he mentions a clean hand and a pure heart. That is describing one person in two aspects. Clean hands, that means the things that are visible to us as clean, we can see. We can follow up with their lives as we look up to them. And number two, that this person has a pure heart. A heart that is steadfast before the Lord. The Lord knows it. Nothing is hidden before the Lord. 
So if he has a, a, a clean heart, that means his hands are pure as he comes. You know what the apostle Peter says? You know, the, those who lift up uh, holy hands, we should lift up holy hands to the Lord. That means the, the hands that have not been defiled, touching things that we ought not to touch. Sometimes we see things with our eyes and our feet will take us there and we go ahead and touch things that we ought not to touch. He who has clean hands. As you're raising your hands up, you have an idea that you're supposed to lift up holy hands. Hands that have not been defiled. Or if you have seen anything that has defiled it, you can take it to the Lord and tell him clearly, the Lord, my hands have been defiled. My hands have handled things that I ought not to. I've touched things that I was not supposed to touch. I've seen things I'm not supposed to pay attention to. Maybe I've touched people inappropriately. God, forgive me. You know, there are things we actually take very lightly, but they mean a lot to the Lord. You know, we go and touch things and do things, and then we come before the Lord like He knows he knows our feeling. He knows that we are human. He knows that we have fallen short of his glory. And he's merciful, by the way. You know how we can preach ourselves? <laughs> and the psalmist is reminding us, clean hands and pure hearts. Who has not lifted up his soul to an idol? You've not lifted your soul to worship something else or someone else apart from Yahweh, apart from God. So the, the second part of the song is an inquiry. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord and stand in his holy place? Who could be regarded as worthy to engage in his worship? and to be considered a friend of God. At times, you know, we're saying that we are God's friends. But is it for real? I am a friend of God. Does he cause me friend? <laughs> oh, it's, it's a one-way relationship. He's my friend. Nirafkiangu <laughs> changuvu. You've not worshipped idols. You've not lifted up your soul to an idol. You've not given yourself to worshipping the things of this earth, whether it's a graven idol, whether it's money, whether it's the people that you dearly love, whether they are the properties that you dearly love, the psalmist says, if these things have not taken you, then you can stand. Don't let these things have their greatest place in your hearts. The things that we have, the things that the Lord has blessed us with. Nor sown deceitfully. You have said things before, but you knew that they were not right even when you're saying them. Guilty as charged. <laughs> said things many times that I know I shouldn't have said. 
if your conscience would serve you right, you know. You know, there are many times you have said things. There are many times, you know, we have, we, we, we call it sometimes, you know, a little lie. Just lie, Kidogo. Just lie. You know, it will save you out of this situation. Do you think that that pleases the Lord when we uh, have sworn deceitfully? This person, the psalmist say that he will receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Righteousness. Oh, we, we didn't deserve this kind of righteousness. We know, as we have studied uh, even the book of Romans, that this righteousness is imputed in us. It is not something that we can earn. We are not able to. But Jesus Christ, in our place, died so that we will be called the righteousness of God. So that when God looks at us, he looks to us or unto us through the nails that went through his own son on the cross. And we are forgiven and set free because of what he did at the cross, not what we are able to do. We are not able to buy our way. We are not able to do anything that can earn salvation. But he say, he shall receive blessings from the Lord and the righteousness and righteousness from God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, of those who seek the face of God. Friends, are we the generation that seeks the face of God? Or are we the generation that is hooked up to, you know, social media, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube? We are warriors. But finding time to seek God in the 24 hours that we have, you know, how much time do we dedicate for God? It should not actually just, you know, I've set 30 minutes or 20 minutes or 10 minutes to God and the rest of the day I'll do my own things. At your workplace, your dedication, you should work as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. Even when your boss is not there, you're working as unto the Lord because the Bible tells us in Ephesians that we have a common master. All of us. Your boss and you, you have a common master. All of you are answerable when time would come. But before that, when you have the opportunity to serve people, to serve um, under your boss, do it faithfully. You know, those who receive the reward from God are those who are seeking the face of God. That is the generation that we, we pray that would have. Those who would seek the face of Yahweh, the face of God. And then the third part of this song would be response. When they were entering or the procession with the ark into the city, that is verses 7 through 10. Say, lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, O you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. So, you know, as a song, so for, for those who are musicians, they, they, we try to break 
songs up in, you know, the stanzas and verses, and you have refrain, you have, you know, a place where you, you, you want people to focus on. Um, and if you look at this song also, you know, an example would be uh, the call upon the gates to lift up their heads that the king of glory might come in. And the response will be, who is the king of glory? And the answer to that would be, he's Yahweh, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord strong in battle. So you see, the, there's a sequence in which he's thinking about this. But when he's making this declaration to, to the people, say, lift up your heads, all you gates, and be lifted up, all you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. And who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, all ye gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. He is the king of glory. He is Yahweh. And, you know, as you, you, you think about this song, David is reminding his audience, he's reminding all of us that the whole earth belongs to God and everything in it. And so what do you need to do in regards to the knowledge that you have about God, that this earth that we live in belongs to God. Everything that He's made belongs to Him. What is your response? He's given you charge, like David, to be a shepherd over Israel. He's always gone out for war, and they have fought many battles, when they inquire of the Lord, surely the Lord gives them victory. Meaning that this war, this battle that they're in, they're not fighting it. It is the Lord Almighty who is fighting the battles and giving them the victory. What a wonderful God that is. He's a holy God, a wonderful God. And friends, in a softer and a gentle way, maybe tonight the Lord is calling you to open up your heart to the King of glory, to open up your heart to the Lord who is strong and mighty, the Lord who is strong in battle. Do you have battles in life that you're fighting right now? Open up your heart to the King. Open up your heart to the king who will fight those battles and gives you victory. And when he gives you victory, victory what do you need to do? Is to shout out the praises of this God. Say so the Lord, the, the earth is the Lord's and everything in all its fullness, the world and all that dwells in it. And even when we see, you see people not regarding God for who he is, not worshiping God for who God is, they've run away and worshiped other idols. They have lifted hands that are not holy. Their hearts are not clean. You gaze upon these people and your heart should be broken. That the, the, the Lord strong and mighty, this long, this Lord is coming back soon. The Lord who is strong in battle, he's coming back when? Too soon. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow. We don't know. Or maybe your life will be cut short before, you know, he returns. But the big question is, have you opened up your heart for the king of glory to come in and dwell in there. He's the king of glory. 
Who is he? What would be the description of your God? Or what is the description? Without reading the psalm, I would want you to go back home tonight and write something about it on your notepad with this question, who is this king of glory? And describe him in your own words. Describe him in your very own words and probably you'll get the depth of the one who you believe in. Or if you don't, then ask him to come into your heart so that he can dwell in you so that you will know who to describe because you cannot describe the person that you don't know. Sometimes, you know, people, you know, you, 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 your, your close buddies, they would ask you about your friend. Maybe you just got engaged. <laughs> like, so, so who is she? Who is he? They want a snippet, a little description of who that person is. Oh, you've never seen people stumble. <laughs> you've never seen people lost for words. You know what they will say? I saw her and I didn't have no words. And that is exactly what I don't have right now. I cannot describe her. I cannot. Uh, I was mesmerized with the beauty. I was, uh, you know, we would say that my, my breath was taken away. He swept me off my feet. I was just down, down, down there. <laughs> we, we, we don't know how to really describe people. But when you think about it, you take a moment, seller, you think about it, you'll be reminded of things that drew you to this person. Maybe the first day you ever saw this person, you never thought that anything would be possible between you, right? Especially for those who are married, all those who have fiancés, you know this for sure. The first day you saw your husband or your wife, you're like, he's just another dude, another girl somewhere there. And then the environment brought you guys together. <laughs> Not really environment. It is God. <laughs> Worked it out for you people who thought, oh, maybe this one won't work. You know, closer and closer, things began to add up, began to add up. That is why we always warn people, if someone comes and talks to you, and you have thought about it, you have prayed about it, don't keep it going. Shut it immediately. Stop it. Because the more you keep it, the more your heart is drawn to it or to them. Right, ladies? Your heart goes before, your, before logic. <laughs> logic will follow you. Think about it. Pray about it. And when the Lord says no, no is a very holy answer. Say no and continue with life. And after the Lord has given you the grace to say no, and this other person goes ahead and finds someone else and they're engaged. Don't say, God, why did you tell me to say no? He knows better than you. In the future, you will sing this song. But God, I thank you for not answering that prayer. Because if you would, we don't know. It's not like they're not born again. They're not born again. But not everyone who is born again belongs to you. How would you describe the king of glory? 
the Lord who is strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And you, if, if you've read, you know, we've, we've gone through this battle that David has been fighting, you'd understand the reason why he would say, you know, he, the Lord is strong and mighty. The Lord is mighty in battle. That every victory that Israel has ever had is because of God. Not because uh, David is a clever guy. Anytime he was clever, they were beaten. The same man, every time he humbles himself and go to God, they have victory. The same man. The same, same person that you are. The many times you will spend a lot of time in the presence of God, you know for sure how God gives you victory. Victory over yourself, victory over the things of the flesh, victory over whatever it may be. It is victory upon victory upon victory. Why? Because you have allowed the Holy Spirit to work and to cleanse you and to always be with you. But when you take a step and you're like telling God, you stay right here, I'll be right back. That's a wrong move. And you know that too soon you'll be gone. You'll be gone. I have noticed and I've seen for the years that I've lived as a young person, a young man, I'm still young, <laughs> 40 years younger, that people can learn a language and speak it so fluent, yet the culture of that language cannot be found with them. You can learn, you know, Germany, you, you can learn Spanish, Espanol. You can learn Luo or Kikuyu or Kalenjin. But if you haven't gone into that culture to know why these words would, be, would mean this important thing, then you just say it as another person and they just know that, you know, you borrowed this language. And sadly enough, many the so-called believers have borrowed the Christian so-called language. They can say a few things. They have a few verses they've memorized. They have a few prayer lines. They know it. Every time you meet with them and they pray, it's the same, same prayer. Nothing changes. We have a lot of things you can borrow from the Bible, but it's the same, same language, the same, same things over and over you'd be able to know that this person, there is no growth. You're stagnant. And you know what stagnant waters do? They stink. They brood mosquitoes, things that will bite people. <laughs> Just don't learn the language for the sake of it. Learn God's word and walk with it. Walk with it. As you're giving a testimony, people will say, for sure. For sure, this is God. Sometimes I look at things. In my mind, it's hard to thank God for those things. But I go ahead and thank God for him not giving me those things. Because if I had them, you guys wouldn't find me here. <laughs> oh, I would be far away from the presence of God. <laughs> but you look at what God has done for you. He deserves a new song. David says in Psalms 40, that I cried unto the Lord, and he heard my voice. And he took me out of the miry pit and set my feet upon a rock. 
people will see it and give thanks and sing praises to God. And he's granted me or given me a new song, a song of praise. I don't know how many songs the Lord has given to you, songs of praise to him. If you have received a song of praise, sing it before the nations of this earth. Let them know what the Lord has done to you. Let them know that the, the Lord is mighty in battle, that he's fought your battles. You're struggling with anything? Bring it before the Lord in prayer. Bring it before the Lord in prayer. It's not like he doesn't know it. He knows it. But you got to take a step and say, Lord, I'm tired of being in this situation. I'm tired of going back to my sin. I'm tired of complaining. I'm tired of this situation. I'm bringing it before you. And I'm going to be joyful regardless of what this situation brings my way. I'm not going to walk like I'm so beaten, so tired. I'm going to walk shoulders up, focus, put oil on my face, comb my hair, comb my hair, <laughs> and step out in faith knowing that the step I am making, he's making with me. I'm not leading myself, but he's leading me. Amen? Open up your heart to the king. He will show you mighty and marvelous things that your eyes have never seen. God, we thank you. We thank you for... Your word, we thank you for this psalm that was written by your servant, reminding us of how great thou art when we think about the earth that you have made, the heavens and the sea, the waters and everything in it, including us humans. Oh Lord, how magnificent, how great art thou. And I pray that our hearts will be drawn to you when we think about how great you are. And help us, Lord, to have an open heart for you, not for uh, the enemy or for our own desires, the, the, the carnal desires. But I pray that your desires will be our desires to bring you glory and to bring you honor that our lives will be a testimony of what you have done, glorious things you have done. Men who see it and glorify you for what you have done in our lives. Thank you, God. As we fellowship with one another, as we disperse, we pray for your blessings over our, this time in your presence. I pray that as we go our way, that you will protect us even from, you know, the rogue drivers around and just people who are evil that will be, we'll get home safe and be in your safety. We thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name, amen.